my name is Christina Costa. I am one of the lead career coaches at Outco. I'm also the learning and development program manager. So I run all of the career courses at Outco. Um, so I help a lot with mock interviewing, confidence building, interpersonal, interpersonal communication skills and training with software engineers. Uh, it's been an amazing time working at Outco so far and all the classes that we teach are virtual. You'll learn a little bit more about that. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, a tiny bit of background on me. I've been working in tech for six years now, which is crazy to think about. Time flies. Um, I've worked in, you know, companies like PayPal, HubSpot. I've worked at startups, very small startups, one called LendBuzz that has, I think they have 35 people now. When I started there, it was 12 of us. Um, I've worked at an education tech startup as well called Duet. Um, and I've even worked at a hyper growth startup called Drift. Some of you may know Drift. Uh, they're actually expanding all over the country. So I have a variety of experiences working in tech and kind of bouncing around from startup to startup, which is, I feel like really normal in the tech world. Um, or maybe in my tech world, it's really normal. But that's a little bit about me. And I'm here to learn more about Francis. So why don't we just dive in? Um, and please, I wanna also iterate, if you have any pressing questions or anything that you really, really wanna know, feel free to ask your questions in the chat um, and we will definitely get to them uh, as soon as possible. And we'll also be doing some Q&A at the end of the event. So if you wanna really you know, hold on to that question, wait till the end, that's totally fine. And if you wanna ask throughout our conversation, we're open to that too. Um, we wanna just make sure that this is a really genuine, candid, authentic, conversation and we're going to be talking a lot about our experiences as women as women of color in tech uh so with that said francis i would love to learn more about your journey into tech um can you please share us share your story with us how did you get into tech yeah sure and i can just give a quick overview of kind of where i am now and then like circle back so hey everyone i'm francis i'm currently a software engineer specializing in ui development on the uh, customer acquisition team or you know fancy word for the web team at slack where my mission is to make your working life simpler more pleasant more productive um, started working professionally as a developer in 2015 i got a bachelor's and master's in computer science and outside of that role i'm also an executive director for thickedia um, which i will you know happily talk about um, more later uh, and I also support Code Nation and the Latino Community Foundation as uh, a leadership member or just a giving circle member. So the way I kind of got into tech, it was very interesting. And I think I will attribute a lot of it to my dad. So my dad immigrated from Peru, Lima, Peru, which is the capital of Peru, um, to the US to study at MIT. And he studied math at MIT and he uh, immigrated here in his early 20s. And when he was in Peru, he had 10 siblings. He was the oldest, so he was one of 10 siblings. Wow. Um, his mom and dad weren't really there for him, so he had to kind of like step up and be the man of the family, quote unquote. So it was like kind of a very quintessential hardworking immigrant story, but to kind of fast forward to that, like his journey, the, why, the, the, the way it kind of affected my journey is because he, um, realized that education was a thing that kind of was able to make him fast forward and kind of get to that quote unquote American dream. He always instilled into my siblings and I like, you know, education, education is the key. Get a PhD. I want to be able to call you Dr. Cornell one day. Obviously didn't happen. And I have like a very, you know, weird relationship with the formal education system. I think it's very broken in a lot of ways, but Either way, like I did get like the master's degree. So like, you know, that's where I was like at my limit there. Um, but to that point, like he always instilled in me when I was younger, like math, science, engineering, like basically STEM, right? And I, I was a big math person, like when I was younger. And so I think that really helped. And I'm like, I attribute a lot of that to my dad. And I'm very happy that he did that. Um, so it really helped that I had like that, that support from my parent. Um, I will say too that the way that he taught me math and STEM was through these computer games. And so that was like, that was the like kind of the, the thing there um, wow. because it wasn't until high school, late high school, like right before I was about to graduate and go to college and start that journey where I was like thinking, okay, what do I want to actually study? As I wasn't a hundred percent sure. 
up until that point, I had explored like becoming a vet, doing biology. And um, I, I did this like medical mission in Vietnam when I was in high school and I, I passed out at the side of blood. And it was like a whole big scene. And like, that was the time when I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do that kind of like hands on. <laughs> I can't, yeah. What was that? I said healthcare is out the question. That, that, that was out of the question. <laughs> yeah, it, it came out of the question. There were like other examples that I could touch on, but it was like, okay, what is the only other thing that up until that point in my life that I was like even remotely interested in beyond biology um, or healthcare, the medical, like um, the healthcare system? And it was computer games. That was the only other thing. Um, so I'm really glad my dad introduced me to that. So I, I kind of learned more about what programming is and like what that what that encompasses. And I uh, took free online coding classes for about a year. And this was in my senior year of high school. And I like just completely pivoted, you know, it was like a just complete transformation. Uh, I decided to major in computer science, didn't have any like formal, you know, experience or anything in computer science. So Can you tell me about well, that, Uncle Francis? Like when you were in your computer science classes, how many people looked like you? Ooh, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I used to have this whole speech where I was like, I called myself like a, a unicorn mm -hmm. uh, because unicorn in like the startup world, it's like the, that company that is valued at a billion dollars or more. And like statistically, it's very rare that a unicorn can happen. It's like a 2% statistical rate that a unicorn will happen or whatever. Um, and I was like, I'm a unicorn too, because like the statistical rate of a Latina being a woman in computing or being in computing is like 2%, you know? So yeah, of the 25% yeah. women in computing, according to the Bureau of Labor in 2016, only about 2% identify as Latina. So like, <laughs> it should not be like some- You were definitely event. a unicorn. That's, that's literally why I asked you that question, because I'm like, I'm sure there was no one really else right. that could you know, relate to in your classes that, that had your same background and experience and, yeah. you know, cultural identity, right? Um, and, yeah, and that's a, that's not a good feeling, and I, I wish it wasn't like that, and I'm trying to work so that it's not like that, um, but yes, like in college, um, so my, I got my undergrad from Hampton University, which is an HBCU in Hampton, Virginia, yeah. And there were other Afro-Latinx people, but I was like the only kind of like Latina in my classes. Um, and then for Cornell, which is where I got my master's, I was the only Latina and I could like, you know, very much confirm that. And so that was, so that was like kind of the same with, both, with almost all the programs I've been a part of. I'm usually the only one. Um, yeah, so that was, that, that's Why did you just out of curiosity, why did you decide to go to a historically black college? Yeah, so for context, um, my dad uh, still teaches there. He's an MBA professor. Uh, he's been teaching at Hampton for 20 plus years now. His name is Francisco wow. Coronel, if you want to look him up. He has this really ugly page <laughs> with his like bio and like his credentials and stuff. And like, I say it's ugly because he hasn't updated his picture. And he has way better pictures where he looks like just more, I don't know, in touch with like <laughs> the current generation. But anyway, rant over um, there. <laughs> and then my mom also attended Hampton University. She got her master's in education, I want to say, from, from Hampton. And my brother attends Hampton. He actually gra mm -hmm. is going to graduate. Wow. Soon. And then my sister attended Hampton. So we have wow. all attended Hampton. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Most generation of. Hampton Peruvians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. We're very close <laughs> with like just the Hampton University community and like I still feel like really uh you know uh close to like the people I'm there. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So it sounds like a lot of your drive and a lot of um the reason that you ended up in computer science in the first place was due to your father, kind of yes. his his exposure into tech and and computers and computer programming um and i and i really do believe that we don't have enough latino figures that in that way in that space right in that industry um mm -hmm. and, and not only latino i think we don't we also lack a lot of black figures um that are in engineering that are working in stem um usually we don't see people right that look like us in stem and i think that's one thing that really creates a barrier 
for people of color, if you don't see anyone that looks like you in high positions, right, in engineering or, or being CEOs of a tech company, then it's really hard to see yourself doing that one day. Yeah, right? and I think like to elaborate on this, if I may, like, it's so important to have that representation in PDE roles, specifically like product design engineering, because I guarantee you those are the roles where there are less layoffs right now. You know, like they're going to be laying off the salespeople, the marketing people, but um, yeah. the engineering folks, like most of them are not being laid off from like what I've heard anecdotally. Um, yeah. So, and those are the folks who are like making it happen. Like they are the ones executing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're, yeah. they're the ones basically they're the backbone of the, of any company, right? They're the ones building the product. Um, yeah. And more often, else. yeah, exactly. And more yeah. often than not, like what you see, unfortunately, is like the token person of color who's like maybe the DNI VP or something for a tech company. And it's like, really, you know, like there's just one person on the leadership page and it's like that person yeah. for the DNI, the DNI team. And it's like, uh, and it's very obvious, you know, it's yeah. obvious, you can catch it, you can call it out. Um, and especially now with everything that has happened around Black Lives Matter, like now is the time to call that out and like demand change. I don't know if it will happen because we've done it so many times, like multiple organizations over multiple time periods, but um, it doesn't hurt to keep trying. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. That's very well said. Now is, now is the time, right? I think people are showing up, people are showing that they are tired of being silenced, right? People have a lot that they want to say. Um, mm -hmm. And right, everything that's going on right now is proof of that, right? Exactly. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more. I love learning about your background. I think that's really fascinating um, that your whole family went to Hampton University. That's so yeah. such a cool <laughs> story, right? I, I did not expect that story at all. Um, <laughs> and as someone, I actually worked in higher education prior to working in tech, actually, I was uh -huh. an international student advisor um, at Northeastern University, which mm -hmm. has actually the third largest uh, population of international students in the country. Oh, wow. um, yeah. yeah, so I used to meet, I always met uh, so many engineers who were coming from China and who were coming from India, um, and they were always, <laughs> Your family wants to come in. <laughs> My brother um, wants to play a board game. What can you do? Um, <laughs> Don't join us. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I just remember meeting so many engineers and so many international students and really uh -huh. the only international students that were given work visas, that were given sponsorships to stay here in this country were the ones who worked as engineers. Mm -hmm. We're all the internationals who studied computer science or information yep. systems um, or, you know, or computer software engineering. Like those were the only ones that were really granted visas and sponsorships to, to live here. Um, and so there was definitely a demand and there still is a demand for people who work in engineering. And I don't think that's ever gonna go, I don't think that's ever gonna diminish. I don't think that's ever gonna not be a demand for, for engineers or people working in, in tech now more than ever, right? We're in this virtual world. Um, yep, that's <laughs> right. You know, now more than ever, right? We are um, all relying on it. Completely, 100%, you know, yeah. there's no excuse. Um, <laughs> so, so tell me, how did you go from being a software engineer to now being the executive director of Tequeria? Tell me a little bit about that. How did that happen? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a fun story. And it has to do a lot with like my current role at Slack. So yeah. this was like three years ago almost where I was not feeling it at my current job and I won't name any names, but it was just like very bad work-life balance. Um, yeah, I just didn't feel like I was in a good spot. Um, so I was starting to look for other jobs. And I looked at companies specifically where I was like using the product all the time because I wanted to be passionate about like the, the company I was going to join. So mm -hmm. Slack was one of those companies. And I submitted my resume, didn't know a single person there, had not done any uh -huh. networking. But what had happened is that when they called me back and they were like, hey, we're interested, I was like, okay, I got to prep. I got to take this seriously because I passed like on the most hardest stage, which is that resume screen. And so that's when you can like really ramp up. So what I did is because I had joined the Quería like a year ago after, like before that, mm -hmm. I reached out to that network and I was like, hey, I'm applying to Slack, could really use help. And I like directly 
I think I did a public message and I also directly messaged people that I saw worked at Slack and four people responded and had conversations with me either over Slack or over the phone. And I felt so much more prepared for like the interview because of those conversations. Um, and so with the Kedia, I felt like I was able to get a leg up. And so from there, obviously I got the job at Slack. And after starting at Slack, I was like, okay, how can I give back to this community that already has given me so much? Um, obviously as a web developer, the first thing I looked at was their website. And you know, yeah. <laughs> um, no offense to David and Sashi, like they're amazing people and like all the folks who worked on the old website, but I, I knew that it could be renovated and revamped. And there was a lot of potential to like funnel people to like different partnerships and donations and yada yada, like all these opportunities to really create this mm -hmm. online presence for Tequeria, uh, which was already like the one of the largest, if not now the largest community for Latinx and tech. So started doing that and that was an open source project. Um, so open source is like, you know, when the code is available online, anyone can contribute. Uh, so I yeah. did that completely revamped the website, everyone in the leadership, or not everyone, but like people in leadership were starting to take notice and they were like, hey, you're doing great work. And I applied to this open source grant from Sentry, uh, which is a tech company that does error tracking. And I won the grant and it was like, it was for $10,000. And it was again to like work on the website and continue to iterate it. And it was the first grant that the Gidea had won, like as an organization. Oh and it was only last year, by the way, for context. Yeah, I was going to ask you, when, did, when was that? It was last <laughs> that year. Was, that was last June, I want to say, uh, June uh, 2019. Oh. And we had only just become, like, as an org, they had become a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, yeah. So anyway, or was that earlier? That might have been earlier, like January, actually, for the, the grant. But anyway, uh, fast forward, you know, I'm obviously more involved. I have helped the Gidea fundraise a lot, um, started out as a board member because of that activity, then kind of went to CTO. And now I'm one of the executive directors and it's like a legitimate kind of part-time position that I have outside of Slack and it's all good and well with them. Um, so my other mm -hmm. co-director is Felipe Ventura. Um, yep. Yeah, shout out to him. He's, he's actually the one who connected us like Alco and Tequeria. So oh, nice. yeah, <laughs> so that's the story. Uh, hopefully that... <laughs> you know, fast forward everything. But um, yeah, I think, you know, this work is so fulfilling. And I, I feel like I get to use a different part of my brain from like, you know, being in yeah. that focus session on encoding all day with Slack, um, and being in like meetings versus like all this um, very activist, um, nonprofit work. It's very different, like mm -hmm. the type of work. So it, it's very fulfilling. And what is what exactly is the, the mission of Tequeria for people who, who've never heard of it before? Yeah, so Thekeria, you know, for context, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We serve the largest community of Latinx in tech across the U.S. And our goal or mission really is to provide them with the resources and support that they need to thrive and become leaders in the tech industry, not just the entry level folks, because I think we have enough of those who identify as Latinx, but actual leaders who can enact change and reform current structures in their own companies. Um, for context, Latinos are the fastest growing population in the U.S. And we all know that tech is one of the largest wealth generators in the U.S. And I feel like that in, itself, in and of itself is such a powerful combination. And like mm -hmm. how much good we can do if we like help amplify and support um, Latinx professionals in that is, is so important. And that's like kind of at the core of what we're doing. In practice, how that looks like is that we partner with ERGs, we do events, workshops for our members. We're trying to launch different initiatives and projects like the job board, the conference, which unfortunately we had to postpone, um, things like that. Uh, and also just kind of bridge the social capital gap. That for us is like the biggest thing because we know that a lot of people find their jobs through networking and a lot of people of color, just especially Latinx folks and black folks like it within tech, they just don't have those connections. Um, yeah. And so really, ultimately, our vision is just to become the most powerful and robust network of Latinx uh, professionals in tech across the world. Wow, that's, that's really amazing. Um, I, I want to learn more about Techidia, right? I want to know what are some ways that Techidia is helping the POC community, the Latinx community right now, um, who may be on the job search? 
Yeah, and obviously this is so critical, right? Because um, we're in the worst period, I think since the Great Depression when it comes to job loss from what I've read. Um, so I wanna like reference this study that Payscale, Payscale did. And Payscale is like this platform for like set to find salaries so that you can compare and contrast. Um, the average ones for tech companies. And they did a study that said between 70 and 85% of jobs are found through networking. And so networking can come super naturally to folks who come from like a family of professionals, such as, you know, myself, a family of educators, or folks who went to very prestigious colleges. Um, and by the time like they enter the workforce, like some young adults already really have that large network and lots of social capital that can help them find those jobs even with very limited work experience. Like, you know, there's that narrative of like, the reason so many people wanna to go to Harvard or all these Ivy Leagues isn't necessarily because of like the courses, because you can kind of get those anywhere. It's because yep. of that network. It is and all that down to that social capital. That's like the, the, the power that these, these colleges have. But young, yeah. young Latinx adults and just Latinx adults in general, they often face that social capital gap so without access to like that same network and connections, it can be much harder to find a full-time job even with the necessary education and skills. So as a woman of color, I can relate to that too because when I was considering, okay, should I get a bachelor's and master's? Like even at that point, I was like, should I even do this? Like, do I have to do this? It, it, it came down to credibility for me and also just like wanting to keep learning because I know as a woman of color, I have to like do that extra effort to make sure that that credibility is there. Like, I think, um, you know, maybe a white man in my position could get away with like less and I've seen that in practice happen. Um, but as a woman of color, I have to recognize I gotta take that extra step. Otherwise it's, I don't know. I, I just have yeah. uh, felt that like in practice. I think 100%, 110% agree with you. I tell people this all the time. I mean, I think the reason people pay so much for these, you know, private universities, these Ivy Leagues, is really not for a better education. It's all about the network, right? I'm, and I always exactly. preach this in all my classes, and I, and I tell this to, to all of my outcoders, all of the students that I teach, um, your network is your net worth. It really, really is. It all, everything in life is about who you know. It's all about who you know and who's going to give you that opportunity. Um, so it sounds like Tech Idea is a great place to meet people in that space, potential people that could connect you to open opportunities or maybe connect you to someone who could, um, you know, be a leader for you or maybe a mentor of some sort uh, along the way. So I love that that you shared that. And I that's actually a concept we teach at Outco is this concept of reverse recruiting and not always waiting for, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, not, I'm not always waiting for people to reach out to you, but to, mm -hmm. for you to actually be proactive and reach out to people, which it sounds like that's actually how you got your role at Slack. Like, yes, you applied online, but then you also made all these connections before actually working there. Um, and you could see how that really benefited you, having kind of that inside scoop, knowing how the interview process was going to be, maybe having some inside, insights into what questions they may ask you um, so you don't, don't feel blindsided at all. I have a few questions here from the audience. Yeah. Um, so I see one question. Roberto says, Applying to jobs, you do always do you always check Latino? Do you always disclose any disabilities there? I have been uh, one of the few Latinos in my computer science program as well. Where is this question? I'm trying to find it. Hold on. <laughs> it's, um, it's even Q and A. Oh, okay. Oof, Q &A. okay. I forgot about that. Speaking <laughs> <laughs> okay. of that, applying to jobs, you do always check Latino. Do you always disclose any disabilities there? I have been one of the few Latinx people in my CS program as well. Um, yes, and I mean, there's this whole controversy too around like race versus ethnicity. Um, oh yeah. Like for race, Latino people such as myself who like, we don't identify as white, we don't identify as black. So it's like, what, what checkbox do you do at that point? Mm -hmm. But I always do put Hispanic slash Latinx um, for ethnicity. So, I mean, yeah, I always say that. Um, if they're, you know, going to, like, it's going to come out at some point, like, you might as well just say it. And it also helps them because they can see their DNI stats and see, like, hey, how many people did, you know, apply that were that I did identify this way? Can we improve this pipeline? So I think it is good to, like, say that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree too. Um, 
you know, I've always had difficulty with that too, because sometimes Latino is not even an option, right? It's like other. And I'm like, okay, well, where do I fit in? Right. Um, but at the same time, in terms of like the disabilities question, uh, that's something that you would want to disclose as well at the beginning, because if, if a company for some reason does not hire you due to you having a disability, is that really somewhere that you really want to work? Right. Is that somewhere that you would even, you know, think you would be, you would enjoy working there. Right. And these are things I, I tell a lot of my students as well when, when they are applying and looking for roles. Um, I tell them, do your research. Really, really do your research. Look who it is. Who is, who is the head of this company? Right. Who is the CEO? You know, what are his values? Try to learn as much about what that person cares about, which is generally a white man <laughs> in the tech space, uh, which is the reality. But like learning more about what is the mission of the company? Right. Are they doing anything in the community? A lot of times you can find this information out just on a company's website, right? Just looking through the website. Um, there's also a really cool website I use called keyvalues.com um, oh, yeah. where you can actually search. Keyvalues.io. Yeah. yeah, is it .io? Okay, keyvalues.io. Yeah. Absolutely love that website. Um, and you can look for companies who really value diversity and inclusion or maybe really value uh, having a diverse workforce or, you know, whatever it is that's important to you. Um, I highly recommend doing, doing your research before applying to any jobs because um, you want to make sure that it's a place where you're going to feel like you're going to be supported um, and that you're going to thrive. So that was one question. I see another question here. Let's see. It says, I'm a POC, I think Richard, with a background in nonprofit social justice and a DEI leadership and DEI leadership development. I always thought DEI and tech might be a good place to apply my skills. But now, especially because of this past week, I'm wondering if it's actually a space I can make an impact. Is DEI and tech legit? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, I love this question. And Richard, I, I highly empathize. Um, there's this tweet that kind of summarizes how I feel about this situation entirely, like especially with everything going on. So here's that tweet and I'll just speak it out, uh, out loud. So Brandy is saying, thank you for your Black Lives Matter graphic. May I please see a picture of your executive leadership team and company board? And I think that in just like those two sentences really summarizes kind of the state and what's wrong with everything right now when it comes to like DNI and tech. Mm -hmm. I will say it is both legit and not legit in many ways. Like there are really a lot of people trying to make it better. I am one of those people, but it is very hard still because we are not, you know, the the well-funded orgs. We are not like this ma these massive orgs with a lot of like people and bandwidth. So we have to just prioritize things and like we have to move a little bit more slowly, I think, than like tech companies where they can move fast. They can throw a lot of money at stuff. Um, but still at the end of the day, like they, their leadership team is like very non-diverse, very homogenous. And we all know that's not good for innovation and it's not good for a lot of things. Um, there was this really good quote that I remember when I was first starting to get into tech about Google and the lack of DNI, and this was like, you know, five years ago, and it was like, you know, considering Google is a search engine, you would think they'd be able to search for more like black and brown employees, but apparently not. So it's like a very tough thing, Crazy. apparently, because like Google is like, you know, master of all things. They they have yeah. the best search engine in the world, but they still can't, um, you know, get those people. So yeah. I, in my experience, I've actually done a lot of diversity and inclusion work in tech as well um, throughout my years working at different companies. And from my experience, I only see companies really do di diversity and inclusion well if it comes from the executive team. Like it has to come from the top down. It cannot be employees, you know, who are maybe entry level or even middle management pushing up right? It really has to come from the executive team. Like the CEO leadership team has to care. Like they have to care and actually want to put a budget aside towards diversity and inclusion. Um, and that a lot of that type of information you can see just by doing some, some research on these companies, like looking up articles on them, like where are they investing money, right? Who are on their boards? Um, a lot of that information you can find online. And I've seen at least through my experience, if a company's CEO is not on board, it's never going to happen. It's not like diversity is not going to happen at that company. 
Um, so really do your research when you're, when you're applying to jobs or looking at different companies to work at, especially in tech. Um, I wish I could give a better answer, but that's, <laughs> that's kind of the, the reality where we're still pushing, right? We're pushing to get more people of color into tech. We're pushing to get more Latinos and, and blacks and Asians into tech. Um, yeah. But, and I think like within tech too, there's still this narrative that it, a lot of focus is on gender equality um but not enough on racial equality so i think that adds on to it a lot um and gender equality unfortunately you know for being honest for the most part is focusing on white women so yeah yeah, yeah. and like to jocelyn's point like do companies get some sort of government incentive to hire women and people of color it is no i don't not to my knowledge but it is a requirement now in california to have women um in in boards Leaders. Yeah, yep. like yeah, at least one female board director or you get a 100K fine. Like that is a, a good policy, a good action item. But again, it's to gender diversity. It's to gender equity. It is not to racial yep. diversity or racial equity. So I don't, we're not quite there yet, right? Um, but yeah, just to answer that question too. That's a great question. Um, I'm gonna see, I'll take one more question from the audience before we get back to our our original questions. So I see one from Jasmine, uh, Jasmine Nunez. How do you suggest companies increase hiring diverse candidates without being token hires? That is a great, great question. Um, I can give my two cents if you want a minute, Francis, or if you have oh, something. Yeah, go ahead. That. <laughs> so for, for in terms of increasing diverse candidates without being a token, um, that again comes from leadership, right? Because we can't just have a bunch of people of color in entry level positions and think that, okay, now we're diverse, right? It needs to be people in different levels, like upper management, lower management. There needs to be people of color in all uh, roles at the company. So it's not just, you know, entry level customer service, people are people of color, and then that makes us a diverse company. It needs to be diverse from the top down, right? So meaning having a diverse board, um, having more, managers who are people of color, right? Having more, somebody on the executive team that's a person of color or multiple people, right? That's a woman or a person of color or someone with a disability. Um, there just needs to be more diversity in all levels in order to kind of combat that tokenism feeling. So I've been there, trust me. <laughs> I've been there. I don't know if there's anything you'd wanna add, Francis, but yeah, just real quick, it's really good to start early and as early as possible, like when you have five people and you realize, oh, we're all, you know, men or we're all white, like that's the moment when you got to realize if you keep going on that trajectory, it's going to get harder and harder to hire anyone else who is not like that because people can be turned off if they see a company and there's just no one else who can, you know, who looks like them, who can relate to them. So if it's like you get to the point where there's, you know, you're still at five and you, then you get to 30 and nothing has changed, it's just like the, the level of effort you're going to have to do is just going to be a lot more. That's what I've heard at least, from, especially with early stage startups. So it's important to get it done as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So my, my next question, I see some people have questions about the job search, right? Um, and some people say they are coming out of a boot camp. They don't have necessarily a computer science degree, right, or a software engineering degree. Um, how do companies, or how do you think, Francis, how do you think companies view applicants, especially Latinx applicants or, or people of color applicants coming out of boot camps without college degrees? Yeah, so I mean, realistically, right, with that kind of background, you will definitely be placed in a more entry level role. But I think like the point is to just get in the door, get in the door and then you can prove yourself. And it's okay to start at like a, you know, a company that is not as well known to just get your feet wet. Um, I know many people who like started at a very, not very well known company, maybe a startup or just like even a different, slightly different industry like tech consulting. They did that for a year and then they were able to kind of like graduate into a more, you know, well-known tech company or just a tech company they felt more passionate about. And mm -hmm. I think what can supplement it, if you feel like, you know, you're just fresh out of a boot camp. And I, I went to a boot camp myself in New York City a while back, Full Stack Academy. 
and that mm -hmm. was like in addition to like supplementing my CS education because again there were like you know the the system is a little bit weird there um that the, there are definitely things that you can do to improve that resume and like give you kind of that extra oomph um what I would recommend is like open source projects like anyone can contribute to those you're building up a portfolio you're actually contributing to things that are used by other developers um, you can attend hackathons, like there are still many hackathons happening, vir happening virtually. And again, it's a way to build out your portfolio and have experience working with other team members. Um, you can start mentoring other people or find a mentor. You can do speaking engagements for tech, for different tech events. Um, and like a lot of people, maybe when they're thinking about speaking and mentoring, they're like, what, I can't do that. Like I, I'm just starting out. But the reality is like, even when I was just starting that out, you have learned a good amount like from that boot camp you do know some stuff pretty solidly so like capitalize on that and like teach that to other people teach what you know to other people because you're going to get better by doing that um so that would be my advice yeah. to like kind of build up your resume make it more strong um with a boot camp and kind of any program like that it's all about immersing yourself and it's not just about learning the content, but just immersing yourself in the wider industry, the culture, different communities, join those different communities. Obviously got to plug Tech ADF, you identify as Latinx and tech, but there are many others, okay? So th that, that's what I would recommend to start off. Yeah, those are all great suggestions. And the other suggestion I will give, um, especially for someone, you know, fresh out of boot camp, maybe you know, doesn't feel super confident, right, in their abilities yet, um, but once again, the, the power of networking, like the power of networking is, is so, it's so important um, because especially, you know, that first job that you're looking for, it's probably going to be from a referral. It's probably going to be somebody, you know, that believes in you and knows that you'll be able to succeed there. Um, even though your resume is not the traditional resume that, that recruiters are looking for. And unfortunately, that is still the reality. Right. The reality of the situation is a lot of recruiters, a lot of tech companies are still looking for that four year degree. They're still looking for that master's degree in computer science. Um, so we're trying to break that. Right. We're trying to break that barrier uh, because that shouldn't be a barrier for entry. Some of the best developers I've ever met didn't even go to college like they are just they were just amazing developers who made great connections and then were given an opportunity, usually because they were white. <laughs> uh, but they were given an opportunity, uh, but either way, it was networking, right? That's how they got the opportunity. Luckily, they already had that network um, because of their background, right? And so we're trying to create that network for ourselves as Latinx people in tech, as people of color in tech. I'm always a huge advocate, and I always tell people, I know a lot of people in tech just from, you know, talking at these types of events, attending different, you know, attending different boot camps and things like that. I just know a lot of people and I'm always willing um, to share people's resumes with other people if I really believe that they could be a good fit. Um, so never, never stop networking, always network. Um, it's really, really important. You never know who you may meet and what opportunity they may have for you at some point. So highly recommend for people fresh out of boot camp, you know, continue practicing, continue, you know, maybe if there's even a project that you'd want to volunteer on. Um, do it, right? Any experience is helpful. Any experience is going to help you grow as an engineer. Um, so it's one thing I, I'd recommend. So I want to do a quick pulse check. I know we have quite a few people in this space. We have about almost 60 people in the room. Um, Richie, do you mind showing the poll questions? I would love to learn a little bit more about everyone here and what your needs are. So if you could please take a minute um, just to fill out the poll so we know who's in the room. and kind of what you're feeling right now. I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, especially here all over the country. Um, I know everybody has seen the protests, the rallies, the rioting. Um, not sure if you've been a part of it, but I have. I feel very, very strongly about what's going on right now. Um, I feel, uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot of justice that needs to be served um, and that our communities have been silenced for far too long. And so we just love to see See how other people are feeling in the same in the same space. Let's see. Also, where can I see the polls? I don't see them. I mean, I it already, but. Uh, so, did you see? It should have popped up on your window. Did you see? It's just it's 
is like background questions. Do you see it, Francis? Yeah, yeah. I answered them, but can I see the results or are they? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Can we see the results? Oh, there you go. Okay, oh. results. Nice. All right. So, seventy-one percent of people are on the job hunt. So, majority mm -hmm. of people here are on the job hunt. Okay. You currently work in the tech industry. It's about fifty. It's about fifty percent. So fifty-fifty. Awesome. Uh, would you consider your company diverse and inclusive? So I see thirty percent. Yes. 55% trying to be, yes. I feel like that's the reality with a lot of companies. The, oh, let's just put it on the website and make it look like we have brown people here. Um, and then not at all, 11%. Okay. And then last but not least, we just want to know how everyone's doing mentally, emotionally. I know there's a lot happening in the world right now. So how are you doing? Just trying to stay positive. Looks like most people are just trying to stay positive and the second largest response is motivated, which is pretty exciting. Um, motivated, and then I see exhausted, scared, angry. I feel all of those things at one time, which is exhausting. <laughs> but I totally relate to all, everybody in this room right now. Um, so m moving on, we want to talk a little bit more about current events, what's going on right now, um, and the, the future of diversity in tech right and what that what that's going to look like so given the current state of affairs francis how is the lack of diversity in tech related or how do you think the lack of diversity in tech is related to the protests going on all around the world mm -hmm. yeah i mean like so obviously i don't identify as black or i don't identify as black and i don't want to speak for the black community in tech what i do want to share is what they have already come together and done, which is create a five point roadmap for how tech companies can come together and support the black community during this time. And these are all from like, I think it's 150 plus black leaders in tech. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna share that and it's like a pledge and the website is down now because so many people visited, I think it got overrun. Wow. Uh, but I wanna share the points cause I jotted them down and I think this is how you know, this is like the response I, I have and I agree with this. Um, so working towards swift prosecution for the individuals who killed George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade by supporting groups like the Center for Policing Equity and Color of Change, supporting police reform and accountability, applying pressure to Bay Area police chiefs and police union leaders. And this one I think is the most relevant and also applies like you know, just across the board for people of color and tech in general, um, is pledging to hire and fund black employees and founders and also making real commitments to promote, mentor, sponsor them and support their success. Mm -hmm. And so that one, I think we can touch on a little bit more. And then the fifth one is helping elect local leaders with a proven record advocating for racial and social justice by supporting races for key positions like mayorship, city council and district attorneys. Um, mm -hmm. So this is like the pledge that they've created and I think like Tequeria obviously has shared our statement of solidarity and we've already are creating actually again like five points that we are trying to show like true allyship with the black community. Um, it is something that affects us too as we have Afro Latinx members. Um, but I think the, the number four part, which is pledging to hire and fund black employees, that I think is what's most relevant to, to DNI and tech because mm -hmm. the needle has not moved significantly at all over the past few years, it really hasn't. And again, there's been constant like ups and downs like of DNI in, in the news. And like, again, many uh, articles showcasing like the dismal statistics for black and Latinx employees in tech companies. But regardless of all that, you know, news and amplification, the needle has not moved. Um, so again, I'm hoping like with more of this like action oriented like protests, things will move and hopefully change, but um, it's a very hard problem. Like, you know, Google hasn't solved it clearly and like they're the best search engine. We are trying really hard to like create those connections at Tequeria, but we are still overly represented at entry level roles and we are still not, there are still not enough of us in leadership roles. There really isn't. Yeah. Um, not at the table per se like we can't we can only do so much you know like as an ERG lead at Slack I can only do so much 
it has to like that action has to come from from the leadership and if there's not any diversity in that leadership then like to your point earlier like how much can be done per se um yeah. like long term strategically where it makes sense where it's not just like you know let's have a statement of solidarity and you know leave it at that to make ourselves feel better about like speaking up but like what is the actual action items we're going to take that are long term and strategic and make sense for us that we can do mm -hmm. um, so that's something we're still doing yeah so you talked a little bit i heard you mentioned that um you run one of the ergs at slack is that true yeah so i i'm a co-lead for fuego which means fire in spanish mm -hmm. and the erg for hispanic and latinx employees at slack yeah Okay. So how do you think companies can be better allies to the ERGs, right? Because I know, I'm sure there's many people in this room right now who maybe potentially there's no diversity and inclusion department at their company, right? They don't even have an ERG um, and they may be looking for a community, right? To build that community. And this is something that I've actually done myself when I worked at HubSpot. There was no ERGs at HubSpot when I worked there. I worked there in 2015. Um, there was no culture program manager role. There was no DNI initiatives, anything of that sort. Um, and actually, me and two colleagues of mine, uh, one of them was, was Black and one of them is Asian, we decided to create our own space, uh, a safe space, because at the time is when there were a lot of, uh, I believe that was when the killing of Trayvon Martin happened and there was just a lot going on in the media and no one was talking about it and no one was addressing it and we felt really alone we felt really isolated um, and so we actually took it upon ourselves to create the people of color at HubSpot POCA which actually still exists to this day at HubSpot so we we took it upon ourselves we're like you know what we're not going to ask for permission we're going to create this space because it's needed it's necessary people need to learn about what's going on in these communities and people need to understand that this is impactful and important and people need mm -hmm. to be involved. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess how, what do you think a company could do to be a better ally um, to an, an ERG or someone trying to build an ERG? Yeah. And like for folks who don't know, cause more often than not, people just don't know what ERG stands for. So just yeah. to like start that. Right. <laughs> employee <laughs> resource group. Employee resource group. Yeah. It's like, I've gotten that comment before when I talk about it. So like I've done ERG work at every company I've been a part of except my first job because it was like I want to say six people and I was like the only woman of color I think beyond one other one who was like our lawyer but anyway like with all the big companies I've been a part of I was always doing ERG work and just like with formal education I have this conflicting or just like I don't know iffy relationship w with ERGs because on one hand I love and support them and I've always been a part of them. On the other hand, I see that the execution probably could be better for a lot of tech companies. Most of the time tech companies don't have anyone who's like the formalized DNI lead or manager. And you've got to have someone like in those rooms with a leadership team like advocating for this. And if you don't even have someone who like has that ownership, it's just like a lot harder to have even those conversations started. So definitely just first off hiring someone and putting your money where your mouth is to like hiring that person who manages and leads that and supports the ERGs. Um, the second thing is like, again, putting your money where your mouth is and giving those ERGs a budget and like helping the leads who are basically providing free labor for your company um, and not getting anything in return really. Um, make that not the case, you know, like give them something in return, give them incentives for putting all this free labor in. Unfortunately, for some reason, like we still have the system with tech companies where people of color are the ones who are put with the burden, the extra burden on top of their full-time jobs to like, yes. um, <laughs> and, and not compensate. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when this happened. Obviously I wasn't there for it, but like, why is this the model? Like, it should be kind of reverse, I think. But um, if it's not going to be reversed, because I don't see that happening anytime soon, like, at the very least, give them money for putting in this labor, give them promotions, because they're doing work that is very important for your company. Yeah. Um, Seriously, I 100% agree. I feel like not only are we in a space as, as women of color, right, or as people of color in a predominantly white male dominated space where we feel the imposter syndrome all the time, even if we mm -hmm. don't want to feel that way, we still feel that way. 
Uh, so we feel imposter syndrome, constant state of anxiety, always having to overperform, right? And over, you know, exert ourselves. And then on top of that, taking on another role, right? As a leader of an ERG, on top of the role you already have and not getting compensated for it. Um, and it's very interesting to me because they'll give you a role as a leader of an ERG, but then you try to apply to be a leader, like a manager or move up in the company and you can be blocked at every way saying that you don't have the leadership experience. It's classified right. differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's, it's so different. Real. It's so different. <laughs> It's not real. It's like less credible. And that's like the problem I have with ERG, the ERG structure in any tech company right now. It's just like a lot of the burden is still on people of color, women, queer people, disabled people mm -hmm. to do that work and like create those groups for themselves when in reality it should be the allies doing that for them and just creating that foundational labor and whatnot. Anyways, yeah. I could I could go on for that. I could go on for days about this. Yeah, it's like... So. <laughs> um, so let's get to a few more questions and then I maybe we'll answer a few Q&A from the audience and then uh, and then we'll make sure that everybody can get out of here in time. So I guess my next question for you, uh, obviously we don't know what the future is going to look like, right? We can't say, I know what 20, I can't even tell you what next month is going to look like right now with the way the world is going. Yeah. But what do you think or I guess, what are some ways that you see diversity and inclusion in tech evolving in the future? Or what do you see as, as the future of d and in tech? Mm -hmm. I think like um, with PDE roles, right, it's going to be around scalability and like showing those projects and experience. Uh, experience. So like when we're talking about recruiting for d and in tech, there are going to be like standardized things in place so that it can scale more easily. So maybe everyone is like joining this platform and they put all their information there and like it learns from them and stuff like what they're doing and it kind of scores them. And in that and of itself, like that can be problematic in many ways because of the algorithms, like the algorithms themselves could be created by people who are very homogenous, like Amazon tried to create a recruiting group and a recruiting tool and because of the people who created it because of those like biases and those blind spots they ended up like recruiting less diverse candidates which was like oops that was like not the intention but that's what ended up happening but i do think in the future we are going to see like more platforms that try to standardize things like try to have a an equal playing field for everybody and that can be super problematic or that can go over really well because everyone's kind of like on the same page but it's kind of like with the SAT, right? Like I kind of see that happening, but for like um, engineering tests or like just PDE type roles where it's kind of easier to do that. I myself am like a very big advocate of not having to deal with like data structure and whiteboarding stuff. And Slack has an interview process that is a bit more modern for full-time engineers where- That's good to know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's based on system design questions and there's like a take-home project. I, I do prefer that route than like the other route because it's not as relevant. But anyway, to that point, maybe a standardization. And again, that could be inevitably worse or better. Um, the other thing I see happening is like this clear digital divide. Um, it may yeah. get better or worse. Like as we know with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, disproportionately like people of color, young people of color, like students, they don't have access to laptops they don't have access to internet like really good internet um and that's like gonna make them behind so it's yeah. like you know if you're thinking about like t teaching a, a fifth grader or like a middle school or a high school or a college student like computer science and getting them you know exposed to that well sure but they have to have a laptop and decent internet access in the first place so there's gonna like this whole digital divide is only escalated even more because of this pandemic because at least in the school system, again, there, it was about kind of creating an equal playing field. And that's how it was with colleges too. Like these college students, if they're living back with their parents, maybe they have to help their parents, they have to help the family business, they have to you know, work outside of that. Who knows, like all the situations are different, but they're not gonna have as much time because again, it's just like the, the work from home environment is really important to that you know, being conducive and it's not equal playing field anymore. So. I feel like standardization, digital divide, and then I think the third thing um, is like this weird 
realization that within the U.S., like, you know, Code 2040 is this great organization that uh, tries to get more um, underrepresented people in, like, internships within tech companies. And Code 2040, like, 2040 comes from the statistic that people have from the Pew Research Center, I think, where they estimate that by 2040 in the U.S., it will become majority minority which means that the majority of people in the U.S. will identify as people of color. So white people we, will become like the, the minority. And if you have that kind of system, in, well, if you have that kind of demographic in place, but in the tech industry, which again, as we all know, is one of the largest wealth generators in the world, that is still like radically underrepresented for people of color, um that's going to be way more yeah. obvious then you know so like i see that playing out and like making that more obvious and again hopefully things get better but i really don't know like you said it's hard to predict anything these days and uh it's all very tiring um and depressing and you know i can go on but like that's kind of how i see it right now yeah so it's it's like a trickle down effect right so our governments are failing us Let's be real. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's that. Uh, there's that's absolutely <laughs> no equity and access to equal opportunities, especially no. in the education space. I've always been a huge advocate, and I've been an advocate for the past five, six, six years um, about STEM programs for middle school, elementary school, uh, especially in low-income neighborhoods, right? In neighborhoods where it is more people of color, like why, are the, why aren't there STEM programs that are strong there? I mean, STEM is the way of the future. It's not going anywhere. Um, we should have stronger science, technology, engineering, and math programs available to all people of color. Um, it shouldn't be only these, you know, wealthy schools that have access to that type of information. And the same thing, you know, I totally agree with you with the digital divide. I think we're seeing it now more than ever, right? Um, all workers, essential workers, right, that are literally the backbone of this country they don't have the ability to work from home, right? So they are being put on the front lines. Um, they are being put at risk every single day to keep this country moving, but then yeah. they're still not only making minimum wage, if that, right? Um, yeah. And the people who are sitting behind the screens, the Amazons of the world are just raking in the billions and billions and billions and not doing anything for the community. I mean, has anyone seen Amazon do anything for the community? I, don't, I really don't understand why everyone wants to work at Amazon so much. I don't get it. <laughs> Everybody wants to work at Amazon, all the engineers I work with. I, I really don't understand because he's ruining our it's economy. They, I think it's because they know they can get rich if they work at Amazon because Amazon is hella rich and everyone knows hella that. Rich. Hella rich. That's so very true. It's That's all about true. that capitalism. It is. It is. So it's just like, and that, I guess that's the answer, right? Breaking down capitalism like that. And how is that going to happen? And I think we're starting to see the, the beginnings of that now. Um, and I think the country is, is finally speaking out, right? And making their voices heard and talking about this digital divide um, is, is huge. So I wish I could say I knew what the future of, of DNI and tech looks like. I would love for there to be a world where everyone has access to internet, where everyone has access to computers, equal access, right? And that everybody can be in this space, but that's not the reality we live in right now. Um, that's a world that I, I hope to see in the future. Um, because as I've mentioned before, and as you know, Francis, like technology is where the money is. And, that, and, and it's not gonna go anywhere, right? People spend the majority of their days on their phones, on their laptops. Um, mm -hmm. communicating with one another in that way. And so we need to be more present in those spaces because if you're going to have the most innovative product out there, you need to have the, in the most innovative team, meaning the most diverse perspectives on your team to make the best product out there. So I think for me, at least my goal and what I will continue to do in tech is continue amplifying voices of leaders like yourself, Francis, um, and Tequeria, right? promoting those types of organizations that are doing the work, that are really trying to connect people with um, amazing opportunities and building that network. Um, I'm going to keep amplifying voices like that. Uh, I'm going to keep supporting leaders like you, uh, leaders, you know, like Joshua at Alco, who's our CEO and is all about diversity and inclusion. Um, I'm all about, you know, empowering others to succeed um, and using the platform that you have to do it. 
right? Everybody in this room right now, I'm sure has a Twitter account. I'm sure has an Instagram page or something. You could be doing your part um, and getting more people of color to learn about opportunities in tech. Um, so we all need to do our, do our part because this is not, we can't do this alone. We cannot do this alone. <laughs> um, so let's see. With that said, we are at the 10 o'clock or, or Eastern, uh, <laughs> 7 o'clock Pacific time now. There are a few questions. Let me see. We could take maybe one or two questions from the audience. Um, but before that, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I see one for, from Richard. It, it says specifically around Tequeria, right? There's so many separate communities within the Latinx umbrella. How do you organize and advocate for all of them when there is such diversity uh, in the Latino community? This question is for you, Francis. Yeah, so like coming from all walks of life, like the Latinx diaspora is extremely diverse, just like the Black diaspora is extremely diverse. So like it's not a one size fits all kind of scenario. Um, so coming from all walks of life, I think Decadia really does believe that the diversity of our community is the most reliable asset that we have. And our space does try to be inclusive by inviting Latinx from the regions of the Caribbean, Haiti, Brazil, as well as those that, who identify as Afro-Latinx, Asian Latinx, or queer. Um, mm -hmm. And we use the term Latinx, by the way, which is not used maybe um, as frequently, or maybe you're not familiar with it, instead of Latino or Latina, because it is a gender neutral and inclusive term. So there are many different intersecting identities uh, within the Latinx and Black community. And we, like within Decadia, we do try to support that um, as much as possible. Uh, so we do realize there's not like a one size fits all. And I will say, unfortunately, and I think this is something we can continue to work on because I see it within our or own org and I want to be transparent about that. Like more often than not, we will see like, because within the Latinx diaspora, there are like white passing Latinx, there's brown passing Latinx such as myself, and there's Afro Latinx, Asian Latinx, et cetera. Um, and too often than not, we see like a lot of white passing Latinx able to kind of break into the industry more easily because again of that, that racism factor, but, um, we, we want to amplify like everyone, you know, not just like a certain color because colorism is very present and very, oh, real. it's In South America. So cool. It's huge. So real. It's huge. So, real. Um, yeah. so much yeah. like whitewashing that happens. So we want to be like very upfront about that and transparent and, yeah so yeah well thank you so much for the work that you do for the latinx community and beyond um and just to give a little context i'm also latina i'm half guatemalan half brazilian in case anyone was wondering because i know i'm very ambiguous looking so <laughs> i identify as latinx as well um so for for anyone here who is on on the job search there is one thing i i, I always say at almost all the panels i like i like to speak at especially regarding diversity in tech is um, tech is also not only just engineering, right? And I think that's a common yeah. misconception that a lot of people have when they think tech. They think, oh, well, I'm not a computer software developer, or I'm not a coder. I can't work in tech. And I'm like, neither am I. <laughs> I'm not a coder either. Um, I took front end, hated it, not for me. Um, <laughs> but I've worked in many capacities. I've worked in consulting. I've worked in digital marketing. I've worked in professional development. I've worked in uh, recruiting. I've had all types of different roles in tech. And so for anyone looking to transition into tech, um, a lot of your skills are transferable, right? A lot of your skills, if you work, say, for example, at a healthcare company and you do like customer service, you could do customer service in tech, right? Same. Yep. Um, if you work in HR at a finance company, you can do HR and tech, right? They need finance, they need HR, they need marketing, they need um, you know, customer success, they need all of these other departments. Engineering and product is one piece of the, of the puzzle, right? It's like one piece of the organization, but there's so many other pieces that your skills are transferable. So that's mm -hmm. one thing I just wanna leave um, everyone with is, is knowing that you know, even if you've never worked in tech, if you are interested in transitioning into tech, you definitely can. A lot of your skills are transferable. You'd be surprised when I work at HubSpot, everyone I worked with was like an English major or a philosophy major in college. And they worked at HubSpot, right? And I was like, how did you end up here? <laughs> you know? And again, it all came down to the network. 
Yeah, right? that's really, right. It's really who you know who's going to give you that opportunity, you know? Um, so that's something that I highly recommend for everyone. And before we head off today's call, I do have one more question for the people in the room who are engineers and who are on the job search. Um, as you may or may not know, Outco, here at Outco, we actually provide training for software engineers who are on the job search. So we provide not only communication, interpersonal communications training, but we also provide technical training um, for you know, passing the algorithms and whiteboarding that you probably have to, you probably will have to do. Luckily not at Slack, right? <laughs> Luckily they don't do that. <laughs> well, they do have um, interns, but you know, that's because we call out interns. <laughs> but for anyone who, who is struggling on the job search right now and would like some, you know, some additional help or would like more training or um, just looking for, for a community of other job seeking engineers to get some experience with, definitely check out Outco. It's a great great training program. Um, I love working there and you will find probably the most diverse group of people <laughs> at our company. Uh, we don't just preach diversity, we practice diversity and inclusion at Outco. Um, that's one of our, definitely one of our values there. Um, so would love if, uh, oh, there you go. So this is the last poll of the day. If you are interested in learning more about Outco um, and potentially joining one of our, co our classes to help you really earn the job of your dream and earn the job that you will feel validated at in a diverse space, check out Outco. Um, and with that said, Francis, is there any final word you'd like to give our audience before we head out for the night? Um, yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I like LinkedIn so much more than every other social media network just because it me feels- too. I love LinkedIn. Oh, I, I it's like my know. thing. Microsoft is a great acquisition, right? So like, I, I don't know what it is, but it just feels like more comfortable when I'm on LinkedIn versus Twitter. I think it's just like the, the medium, you know, some people are more yeah. comfortable with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, what have you. I've just felt more comfortable sharing stuff on LinkedIn. Um, so definitely feel free to connect me, to connect with me there. I'll share my LinkedIn. I think someone uh, shared it. Oh yeah, there you go. Thank you, Richie. Um, and you know, if you identify as Latinx in tech or you want to join as an ally, please feel free to join Tequeria. Um, again, like we have over 6,000 people in our Slack, over almost 10,000 members like across, you know, the wow. world now. Um, so we're a very thriving, growing community and we, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Francis, for your time. And um, I hope to see you again soon as CEO of Slack one day. <laughs> <laughs> Company. Maybe, maybe CTO. CTO. <laughs> okay, I'll, we'll take that. CTO of Slack. <laughs> One day we'll see Frances as a CTO. Or maybe she'll start her own Slack. Who knows? Um, <laughs> but thank you guys all for your time. And, uh, and please check out Tequeria. Please check out Outco. Um, and please, if you can, give back in any way that you can. Um, please check out that article that Frances shared and, and see different ways that you can give back to the community.